Hey ladies and gentlemen, it's Steve here. Before we get started this week, I want to let you know that on BJJ Mental Models Premium, we just launched an awesome three-part series with four-time world champ Dominica Obelinite. It's about competition and the crushing emotional pressure that can go along with it. Critical listen for anyone who's a competitor or really anyone who works in a high-stress environment. Give it a shot, premium.bjjmentalmodels.com. You can check it out and get a free trial. Give it a listen. If you don't like it, cancel with no risk. Again, premium.bjjmentalmodels.com and enjoy the show. Hey, welcome to BJJ Mental Models episode 153. I'm Steve Kwan. BJJ Mental Models is your guide to a conceptual and intelligent jiu-jitsu approach. And today... I am here with someone I'm very excited to talk to, the Bob Woodward of BJJ, Ms. Avery Clements. Avery, how are you doing? Hey, Steve. I'm doing good. How are you? (laughs) I'm pretty good. I guess technically you are now the retired Bob Woodward of BJJ, (laughs) right? Uh, Yeah, semi-retired, I guess. (laughs) No longer managing editor, just uh, writer. (laughs) Well, I I am going to go out on a guess here and say that most of our listeners are probably astutely aware of who you are, but just in the off chance that we got some stragglers, why don't you give yourself a quick intro? Yeah, so I used to be the managing editor of the Jiu-Jitsu Times about a month or two ago. I decided to uh, take a step back from that. Um, And now I'm just a writer. I haven't really written anything since I took that step back. I've kind of taken a break. But I'm a BJJ Brown Belt, train at Trinity MMA, and as of recently, a sponsored hooks athlete as well. Nice, nice. I'm curious to ask, have you figured out what you're going to do now? It was kind of sudden when you left the Jiu-Jitsu Times. It surprised me because you'd just broken that huge story about Cyborg and you'd put out some incredible articles that we've shared and talked about quite extensively here on BJJ Mental Models. And then we got the news that you were leaving us, which is very sad. <laughs> I'm, I'd love to dig into that. Like what, what happened? Was it a change in a life circumstance? I'm just curious to know... Uh, what made you decide to to switch a roo and if you can share where you're going next? Yeah, absolutely. So I know it probably seems sudden to a lot of people and it may have seemed connected to that whole saga, but it was something that I'd been thinking about for quite a while. I had spoken to Kit who runs the Jiu-Jitsu Times, man, ages ago, probably er- like early this year, probably in April or May, just saying that I was a bit burnt out. I've been writing professionally for about 10 years, and I just needed to switch things up. So I pursued um, a bit of an education and getting certified to be a personal trainer and group fitness instructor. And so I had been doing that for quite a while. I think I was 13 weeks into that when the fight sports news kind of came out. And I think a lot of people thought that my departure was connected to that news. It really wasn't. (laughs) It just so happened to coincide with that. So my original goal was to be a personal trainer, group fitness instructor, and that's still in the the plans at some point. But um, I'm currently employed full time at um, a local gym as a uh, membership consultant. So I basically sign people up to go to the gym, which is something I'm passionate about anyway. I've kind of been doing it for free (laughs) for uh, my jujitsu gym, you know, just like getting people into something that I'm passionate about. So I understand that for a lot of people that seemed kind of sudden and I wanted to give people a bit of a heads up because I know this sounds very, I know I'm not like an actual celebrity, but I know I do have kind of a small set of people who do follow me pretty closely. And I just wanted to give them the heads up that, you know, I was taking a step back that I would still be involved in some capacity, but that I just needed a break. And that, uh, yeah, I didn't really feel like covering combat sports to the extent that I was and covering these athletes that, you know, I was just kind of like, I don't know, like they, they, I don't feel like they really deserve that coverage. You know, like it was hard to be like, man, like, I think you're kind of a morally bankrupt person, but you're competing. So I have to cover your matches. And that just didn't sit well with me. And I wasn't as passionate about it anymore. And I felt like I needed to open the door for fans of combat sports who actually did actively want to cover that. So, yeah, I just decided it was time to take a step back and try something new. Yeah, I'm with you on that. When I started jujitsu, like everyone else who starts jujitsu, I was just totally enamored with the 
technical intricacies of how this thing works and what's going on out there in the sport and who's who. And I was really just all about trying to maximize my time on the mats. Uh, but as I, I get older, the longer I train this, the less I care about things like that and the more I care about jujitsu as a vehicle for growth. And it sounds like you're in kind of a similar situation where you're very much into the advocacy and the culture aspect of jujitsu and the positives that something like this can bring. But we also have to be aware of, unfortunately, the negatives that have come along with that. And a big thanks to you, of course, because I'm not sure that without you, we would all be truly aware of exactly what the situation is like. I mean, I think everyone, you know, everyone knows that awful things have happened in the jujitsu space. But I think until you really took a chunk out of this, people didn't really quite understand how widespread this is and how challenging it is to be a woman in the sport. And I think that the work that you've done, especially over the last year or so, has really made people understand this is not like a one in a million things that happens in this sport. This is extraordinarily common. Some people would even say it's ingrained in the culture, which I think is a fair thing to say of jujitsu. And I think that the more people who can cast light on that, the better. So I saw, of course, after your article, the story was picked up by the New York Times, which is awesome. So I, I think it's great that you've done a lot of that advocacy work. Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. It's still kind of surreal to me that I would like to get that kind of credit because I don't see myself as having done that much. <laughs> I, I just feel like I'm kind of talking about what I see. But there's a lot of people in the sport who are, you know, doing kind of similar work, they just maybe don't have the platform for it. And so that's why I'm really grateful for, you know, the opportunities that Kit has given me as well, because I know there are a lot of people, you know, a lot of publications as well, who would never let me publish that kind of stuff. And, you know, really talented writers, really important activists in the community who wouldn't get that platform. And they're just trying to push, push those, I guess you could say those ideals, and they just don't have the platform for it, you know, and so I'm really grateful to Kit for letting me speak my mind with those things and letting me publish those things. Because without that, I, I feel like that would still kind of be on the down low. So how do you break these stories? Anyway, how did you discover this stuff? I'm curious. Was this the result of some active investigation on your side? Is, is there like a secret Avery tip hotline where we can send you stuff? I just, I'd love <laughs> to know how you're always on the, the thing, you have your finger on the pulse of this stuff. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of it has come from, <laughs> I don't want to say like actively ignoring the big names of the sport in favor for the smaller names in the sport, but just building trust with the community, which I've tried really hard to do. Not for the sake of my job, but just because I'm very passionate about the community side of things. Like I didn't get into jujitsu because I wanted to, you know, meet these, you know, very niche famous athletes. <laughs> you know, I got into it for the community side of things. And that's why I've always loved it. And so as a result of that, I've met a lot of really amazing people in the community and, you know, talked with a lot of people and built those conversations. And as a result of that, I think, those people have felt comfortable coming to me with those stories, even if they don't get published. Like I get messages from people saying like, look, I, I can't say anything about this publicly, but like, I just need to share this with somebody. And I feel like I can trust you and because of the things you've written. And that's really like, I, I don't want to say I cherish that or I treasure it, but that's something that I hold very dear is that trust. And so when these stories started coming out, it was through, you know, these victims that, had these experiences and they came to me or their loved ones came to me and said, Hey, this has happened. And it's, it was kind of like this underground grassroots movement for years. And it was a very small group of people who were having this conversation that had heard what had happened. And we were talking about it amongst ourselves and saying like, this story needs to get out there, but like, we didn't know the best way to put it out there and the safest way to put it out there that would be safe for us and the victims. And so it really wasn't until it was Tex Johnson actually was the one who kind of came forward and uh, yeah, said that he had trained with Marcel Goncalves at Wagner's gym. And that's when the ball kind of got rolling. And at the same time, Mo, you know, who runs ADCC at the moment, he got a hold of the story at the same time. And he's obviously a very powerful man in the community. So it was kind of like as I was preparing to release that story, Mo just put it all out there. So we were on the same timeline, essentially, 
Mo just got there first. And that's totally fine. Like I have never and it made it so much easier for me too. like I people were like, Oh, like, are you sad that you weren't the one to like break the story? And that's not the case at all. It was very much a team effort, you know, where Mo released what he knew. And then I kind of released something a bit longer with a bit more detail. And so yeah, it was it was very strange. And like, (laughs) I don't necessarily have any training, like formal training in journalism. And so I had to also dig deep and find the right way to do this and learn from my mistakes in the past. So it's been a that was a years long process of talking to people and having to explain like, you know, there's a there's going to be a right time to release this information. And it's not now. And I think the way it happened, I'm hoping that the way it happened was the right way it was meant to happen. So how do you know when it is the right time? I'd love to explore this because something that I have learned, I did not until until I started training jujitsu and I kind of saw the dark underbelly of the sport. I did not understand how hard it actually is to come forward with a story like this. You know, I, like everyone else, I, I get my my knowledge of the police system from television. And so mm-hmm. if you if that is the case, then you assume that if someone does something criminal in the world, that all of these super cops descend on that person and they go to court and the person goes <laughs> to jail and that's the end of it. But What I have learned is that that is not how it normally goes down, right? There is tremendous pressure on people not to speak out. When they do speak out, a lot of the time the messenger is attacked instead of the accused. And I've seen this firsthand, especially this year. And you talked about the timing here of the story. And I'd love to explore that. What do you mean when you say the right time to come out? How do you know when, okay, it's it's time to release this versus is too early. There's got to be some sort of checklist or rules that you must have employed. Yeah, I mean, the number one thing is always like actual evidence, you know, releasing a story just based on hearsay is not really substantial unless there are a lot of people coming forward and saying that they saw or directly heard the same thing. And another big aspect of it is just kind of keeping a finger on the pulse of what people are thinking and saying about this stuff. Because when this, when I first started hearing about this stuff, it was like 2019, it was after Marcel had been arrested. And I was told that, you know, about these photos that Cyborg had been spending time with Marcel. And like, I hated to say this. And I still hate to say it, but I'm like, I don't, think this is enough for people to care. And that is so crazy to think about now knowing how many people do care. But I still hold that in like, I still believe that if we had released that at the time, I don't think it would have gotten a lot of attention. And so I was kind of like, you know what, I just don't think this is the right time. I think eventually there's going to be more to this. I don't think it's going to stop there. And so we waited. And plus, like, like, I hate to say this, I don't hate to say it, but like it, there was nothing criminal about spending time with somebody who hadn't been convicted of an offense like this. There's still not, you know, but I just had a feeling that in the future there would be more to that story. And so we waited and we waited and we waited. And eventually there was more that came out. There was more evidence and there were more people coming forward and being willing to talk about things that had happened within that organization. And that kind of made it the right time. I think especially when Tex came forward and said that he had trained with Marcel at Wagner School, that was pretty substantial, you know, and he had photographic evidence that, you know, he'd been poked in the eye. We didn't know if it was from Marcel. He claimed it was, but it was substantial enough that that was the point where we were like, okay, this is enough that we can put something out there. We felt that people would actually care about it at that point too. And yeah, it just, it felt like the right time. Kit agreed that it was the right time. And so that's when we decided to put something out about it, but it's tricky. It's delicate. And we want to make sure we're doing right by everybody as well. Like I'm not going to put something out there without trying my best to get every single side of the story. Because regardless of how I feel about a certain situation, it's I, I'm foremostly concerned with ethics in journalism and doing my job properly and making sure that everybody is treated fairly as possible in a story. So you do have to get 
quotes from as many people possible who are involved. And so that's that was when it was time, in my opinion. So in in that in that comment, you said that you feel like people probably still don't really care. And I'm reminded of uh, the film Hotel Rwanda, where there's a scene mm-hmm. where they're talking about how awful this is. And man, when when the rest of the world finds out about what's happening here, they're all going to come in and help us. And, and someone I, I can't remember who I think it was Nick Nolte in the film says, you know what? People are going to see this on TV and they're going to say, wow, what's happening to you is horrible. And then they're going to change the channel. And I worry in the jujitsu space that the same thing could happen. I mean, I think most people on their face, if you talk to them, would say, yes, it is terrible what has happened in jujitsu. But I think ultimately most people are not really willing to do anything different about it. They're not really willing to to stand up or significantly change what they do. And I think there's also a a rush to defend the heroes of the sport for a variety of reasons. I, I certainly have seen that myself, where when these accusations are, are levied, there's the, the same refrain every single time, the exact same excuses come out about how, oh, well, what if it's, you know, what if this is that 1% chance where actually the accusations are false, or they start attacking the credibility of the messenger, or there's a whole bunch of, you know, there's like the same tired tropes that people go back to when one of these accusations is made, one of these stories breaks, and there's a rally to defend the celebrities in the community. And to some extent, I understand that because there's this is a sport, right? There's always going to be a degree of hero worship, but we also have to hold our heroes accountable. Nobody's perfect. Nobody is an angel. And we need to understand that someone might have a, a, a lovely sterling reputation as a public figure, but the real person under the hood might actually be quite different from the way that they've been branded. Um, that's that's very much been my story with this martial art. You know, I got into this because I heard the Gracie mythology. You know, I thought it was an awesome story. And of course, the more I learn, the more I understand that the Gracies are a very complicated family. They are they are not the brave, noble warrior monks they would have you believe. There have been some awful things done by the family, right? And it, mm-hmm. especially when you look at historical figures, there's, there's a lot of complexity there. And we need to be willing to hold people accountable rather than just trying to insist. They, they must be heroes. You know, they, they, they're on this pedestal. They must be good people. I simply cannot believe this stuff. I, I've sort of come to the conclusion that the more I learn about this sport, the more widespread I feel that these problems actually are. Yeah, I totally agree. And I feel like that hero worship, I'm grateful that it's being spoken about a bit more and that, you know, the mythology about the Gracies is kind of being dismantled. But it's something that's so pervasive in pop culture. It's something that is pervasive in in gyms, you know, as you're a white belt and you walk into a gym and your instructor is having you bow to this photo of you know, a long dead Gracie, like Mm -hmm. it's, they're so elevated. And then anybody who's a black belt in jujitsu, like, especially the way people portray jujitsu black belts as a whole, you know, it's like, oh, you know, you can get a black belt in this, you know, quote unquote, fake martial art in three years, but in jujitsu, it takes a decade, like there are black belts, and then there are black belts in all caps, you know. Um, and, And I think that, does more harm than good. Like, yeah, it does take a long time to get a black belt in jujitsu. Yes, like, you know, from a practicality standpoint, you know, like, I, I believe that most, if not all, martial arts are valid in their own way. But from a practicality standpoint, like, you know, it, it does take forever to be halfway decent at jujitsu, as we know. But that mythology surrounding black belts and that hero worship is so damaging and it it reinforces so many cult-like mentalities around the sport and that hero worship and the way that athletes who have all these followers on Instagram and Twitter, the way they band together to bully marginalized people who are speaking out against them and even non-marginalized people, you know, just regular, you know, I guess you could say privileged people who are speaking out against them. Like it, it really deters people from speaking truth to power there. And that's really disappointing, especially when you consider how jujitsu is made to be made out to be the sport where like, oh, the little man can beat the big man, you know, David beats Goliath. And the reverse is often what's actually true, that Goliath bullies David, (laughs) you know, into shutting up about the things that matter. And that that's so disappointing to me. And it's hard for people to realize that that's what's happening. It takes a while as well. Yeah, I think for me, I hit probably purple belt or late blue belt before realizing just how 
often that happened. And that was really, really upsetting to start to realize. Yeah, I had almost an exact experience like that around blue purple belts. That's when my eyes started opening up to kind of the the dark side of jujitsu. And uh, you know, I love jujitsu. I, I think a mm-hmm. lot of people might hear me ca- always criticizing it and they might think Steve must hate jujitsu. What's he doing? But like, look, I wouldn't devote this much of my life to something if I didn't absolutely love it. Mm-hmm. I just want it to be even better than it is. And like so many people, when I started, you know, I was infatuated by the art. I was infatuated by the techniques and I was given the lore. I was told to bow to the dead guy on the wall. I was told to buy the team gi, all of that stuff. And when you are a white belt, you don't know better because you don't have that context, right? You mm-hmm. you hear this story, this lore of this family and of all of these other incredible figures in the sport and you start training and this stuff actually works, right? One of the things about jujitsu that I think is so addictive is it actually works. You can measurably tell that you're getting better at defending yourself Mm -hmm. and it's very intoxicating. But when you're, when you're a white belt, you're normally so focused on the, the techniques and the learning and the actual rolling. You're not really thinking about the culture and the big picture. And that kind of realization often comes in later. And maybe part of it is because no one actually gossips to the white belts. But <laughs> I remember when I got my blue belt, suddenly now I'm getting sucked into all of these, all of this gym drama and these conversations. And I'm thinking these people are like grown up children. They just, they don't behave like adults in a lot of ways. And I, I feel like there there we all go through that phase at least i hope we all go through that phase where the at some point the marketing veneer comes off and we all actually start to understand okay this sport is not the perfect thing that it was made out to be it's awesome but it's not perfect and there's things that could be done better and a big part of that is is the culture like you said you know you listen to the gracie lore and you would believe that these people were a bunch of brave warrior monks from brazil but the real story is not so kind to them, right? They were, I would definitely not go to the Gracie to learn ethics. You go right mm-hmm. back to the history of, you know, Carlos Sr. and Helio and those guys. And they they were not saints. They were not lovely no. people. And to this day, although I'm sure the family has has cleaned up quite a bit, even the, you know, the current generations and, and their parents, they've, they've done some awful things, right? I mean, I'm sure I don't need to go on here and name it. But if you, if you look into like Gracie drama, you can find some dirt on a lot of them. They've had uh, a lot, a lot of brushes with the law. A lot of them have said and done just absolutely heinous things, but they've also been really good at image control. And it's not just the Gracies. I mean, it, one of the things about this sport, and maybe it's the size of it, maybe it's because it's very small and niche. It just doesn't seem to get a lot of sunlight. It doesn't get a lot of oversight. And so that allows the darkness to flourish. It allows bad things to happen because nobody cares what happens in jujitsu. And I kind of wonder if that's why we have the problem is just because it, we're, we fly under the radar of pop culture and there just aren't enough watchdogs keeping an eye on things. No, I completely agree. And I think that's something, I feel like it's a combination because when you look at MMA, like obviously, you know, everybody knows what the UFC is, but I think because people frame it as this, you know, oh, it's a sport of brutality, like it, it is primal. And so all this stuff that's being said and done, like it's it's just the nature of these, you know, these primal beasts of men and even women, you know, who are in the sport, like, what do you expect from people who beat each other up for a living, you know, but you're absolutely right about jujitsu where it is pretty small. And I feel like if this stuff, a lot of the stuff that has been said by these big names in jujitsu, that was said by like, an NFL player, an NBA player, you know, any of these big, big sports, I think there would be a lot more mainstream controversy, but jujitsu is not mainstream. And so what ends up happening is, like you said, the the image control that's being done by these big name athletes, you know, I say big name in quotes, but um, because nobody would know who these guys are on the street. Yes. But <laughs> a lot of the image control is being done by other jujitsu athletes who nobody knows what they are you know they're the comment section warriors who are like oh this guy's the king like shut up peasant you know and and Mm -hmm. they have this weird it's like this little army behind them you know and so then it further enforces that god complex again from these quote-unquote big name athletes who nobody would recognize on the street but when you're in a combat sport like that's dangerous like physically dangerous you know, this is not 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 saying there aren't like soccer athletes who could beat people up, but like that's really scary to have somebody who's one of the best combat sports athletes in the world, 
you know, who is saying openly that they don't care about ruining somebody's career or crippling somebody. And then you have all these eyes on them and you have to put your social media profile on private because these people are messaging you death threats. And, you know, like that's, that's really heinous and awful. And it's especially heinous. And like that should be treated so much more seriously in the sport that we're in. And it's just not. It it really is. I mean, there's there's so much misbehavior in this sport, just straight up violence a lot of the time. And it just for some reason, no one seems to care. I mean, there's a slap on the wrist whenever this happens. Right. Mm-hmm. And you're right that it, it has extra weight behind it when you know that these people can and probably actually want to fight you. Right. They actually do. Mm-hmm. Um, I have received so many physical threats in the past year. It's it's unbelievable. I mean, I this is not something that is part of my life I am accustomed to. Uh, When the pandemic happened, you know, we started talking about how, hey, you should probably go out and get your vaccination. I thought for sure, knowing the jujitsu community, that that would piss off a lot of people, but actually they handle it pretty well. It wasn't until we had Emily and Dominica on the podcast talk about this exact issue and the amount of just like straight up hate that came from that conversation, which I thought was a pretty measured conversation. I mean, you can go back and listen to it. It's not, yeah. no one's freaking out about anything. It's just Emily and Dom sharing their personal stories of what's happened to them in the sport. They're not putting anyone on blast or doing anything bad. I thought it was a, a reasonable chat, but the amount of hate and blowback that I got from that, and, and I mean, who am I? I'm just an idiot with a podcast. I didn't even really say that much. I just gave them a platform, but I was getting threats of violence. I still have people kind of stalking me on the internet it's really weird and I can only imagine what it must be like for an actual woman in the sport because you've got to deal with this shit on a daily basis, especially as you develop a bit of a profile. And yes, to your point, I've always wondered how how many females in the sport, especially those who have a profile, just turn off all ability to, to be messaged because it's probably a dangerous thing to have these people reaching out to you. I can imagine that after the article, you probably got a ton of blowback too. And I'm, I'm sure that for the, the big figure women in the sport, they probably get the stuff on the regular. Yeah, you know, it's funny. Um, and what actually surprised me is I really braced myself for a lot of blowback from that article. And I really didn't get that much. And I think part of it is because Mo was even louder than I was. And I think in a weird way that helped. And I've told him that like, we've been, you know, we've talked through this whole thing. And I know he's gotten like a ton of shit for it. And I have just kind of been the reporter in the background. And that's been really strange for me. But I also know people are scared, or it seems like they're scared to actually talk shit directly to me. Um, but like, I hear about it through the grapevine, like, oh, man, like, this person is so offended by what Avery wrote, like, she better hope she never runs into them. I'm like, I probably won't. Like, I'm in Australia. (laughs) (laughs) It's probably not gonna happen. Um, You know, but you're welcome to come try and find me here. But yeah, like, I'm actually stunned at the number of people who are, they seem like they're scared to say anything to my face or even in my DMs. But they're very comfortable saying it to other people. And then it eventually gets back to me like, oh, six months ago, like, you know, this, this big name athlete said that Avery was like, this hardcore feminazi bitch. And like, oh, you know, she's gonna get her shit rocked if she ever runs into them. And like, they never do. You know, like, I've been at these big events with these athletes that have supposedly said these things about me, and they avoid eye contact with, with me. And I'm like, I'm five to 120 pounds. Like, I'm small, (laughs) you know, I cannot do anything to them. But I'm like, why are you scared? And that just shows how powerful words can be. You know, Mm -hmm. it's just, it's kind of funny to me. But yeah, a lot of people have thought that I would get all this blowback and all these threats from writing this stuff. But recently, I really haven't. And it's been kind of (laughs) nice. But it's, I'm also like, what's being said behind the scenes, you know, like, who's planning stuff behind the scenes? Yeah, it's, you know, I I think that we have to remind ourselves because I know that sometimes we live in a bit of a a bubble here in the jujitsu landscape. But I think we I think jujitsu people need to remember that. Look, jujitsu might be this weird, uncivilized, violent hobby, but the real world is not like that. 
right? The real mm-hmm. world is not a, a high school playground where you can just go beat people up and assault you. I, whenever someone messages me and they say like, I, I want, you know, I'm going to kick Steve's ass or something. I'm always thinking like, are you serious? Do you yeah. think that if you just like show up at my gym and you want to try to hurt me that you and I are going to have this big epic jujitsu throwdown and you're going to be like a modern day warrior? Is that what you think is going to happen? Because what's actually going to happen is the cops are going to get called and you're going to go to jail before you even touch me because this is a civilized yeah. society and we don't fight people. We don't assault people. And if you think that we do, then you're seriously fucked up. So I I think that there is a degree of almost um, naivety uh, of how the real world works within our sports. I know that a lot of people who do jujitsu, it it is their whole life, right? You can actually Mm -hmm. make a decent living out of this martial art. And a lot of people, it's sort of all they got going on. And they might not have that kind of perspective. You know, maybe maybe they haven't ever been in an, an environment where this has come up. But in the real world, you can't just go around threatening to assault people, right? Not cool. And I think that what it's going to take for us as a sport to clean up is more transparency, more visibility in the mainstream where people really kind of understand how the sport works. I think as the sport grows, especially as if it starts to get regulated, as it moves towards being more of a mainstream sport, I think a lot of it will clean up on its own. I hope so. But right now, it does sort of feel like a lot of people who who live the jujitsu lifestyle, very much the kind of in a bubble about what is considered acceptable behavior and what is not. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> but I think even they have the common sense to know you can't just go around assaulting people in person. I would hope so. <laughs> I would really, really <laughs> hope so. Like occasionally you hear about people doing some absolutely unhinged things. But yeah, I would hope they would realize you can't just do that stuff that you heard about like in the past with how the Gracies with Dojo Storm and just like, you know, challenge you to fight. Like that's silly. Like it's clownish, you know, even yes. in our sport, you know, it, this is not, you know, some martial arts movie like it's real life and you can't do that but again like like you mentioned it, it, jiu-jitsu people tend to live in a bubble and i was very much in that bubble really until um until recently when i switched jobs like my whole life was jiu-jitsu my friends are all from jiu-jitsu pretty much at this point my job was jiu-jitsu my hobby was jiu-jitsu my exercise was jiu-jitsu like literally my entire life revolved around jiu-jitsu and i was far i'm far from the only person to whom that applies. You know, there's so many people who, like you said, they make their living off of jiu-jitsu, a good living out of jiu-jitsu. And we tend to forget that the rules that apply to us in this very niche sport don't apply elsewhere. And it's funny talking to people outside of the sport. And especially when all this fight sports news was breaking, somebody outside the sport asked me like, ah, so what's going to happen? Like, are people going to get their black belts revoked? Like, what's going to be the punishment from like the regulation of the sport. And I just laughed. I was like, <laughs> we don't have like, like what is the overarching authority in the sport? We have the IBJJF, which like that's a for-profit organization. You know, it, it's a company really. It's hardly mm-hmm. a federation. Like there's no regulation that goes on there really. You know, like there, there's no body you know, reaching over the sport that's like, hey, you can't do this. There's a rule. You know, there are some like soft rules, but we've seen time and time again that they aren't really heavily enforced. You know, there's no real, the support systems that are in place for athletes are done by independent people. It's crazy to me, you know, when you look at what exists for other mainstream sports and people are like, oh, I want, you know, we want jujitsu to be in the Olympics. I'm like, are you really sure about that? Like, do you want the eyes of the world on the sport because I don't think (laughs) you're prepared for how it's going to be perceived. You know that you're not allowed to be on the sauce in the Olympics, right? Like if you go to the Olympics, (laughs) you're not allowed to get roided up to the gills. So that's one thing that's going to change. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Like there there would be such a small percentage of these well-known athletes that would actually be allowed to compete in the Olympics. Like the world, the jiu-jitsu world is not prepared for how the quote unquote real world would look at our sport if there was a bigger spotlight on it. You do not want jujitsu in the Olympics. Trust me. Yeah. <laughs> I, I do get a kick out of the, just the level of scale. I remember when the uh, Simone Biles thing happened and Gordon Ryan was commenting about it. And he said something oh, like God. as, as another high level athlete, I, I am qualified to say what's going in in Simone's mind. And like, look, I, I try to take a charitable view of Gordon. I mean, I, I hate like half the stuff he says, but I try to take a charitable view, but I got to say, it's ludicrous to think that because you went to some like 
jujitsu Roy tournament and one that that's the same as like being a multi-time Olympic gold medalist in gymnastics. I don't know if people mm-hmm. understand like gymnastics is one of the biggest sports in the whole world. It's taught in mm-hmm. every high school gymnasium to have someone at that level who is like a repeat champion. That's a big deal. I mean, nothing against Gordon and his accomplishments. He's obviously one of the best in our sport, but our sport is also like a tiny backwater compared to Olympic level gymnastics. Yeah. So I, I thought that was a funny quote in terms of like understanding, man, you're a bit out of your lane here, buddy. And don't get me wrong. He's way more qualified than I am, but all the same, it's just, it's a different level of scale. And I think it's kind of an example of how jujitsu people sometimes don't understand how we fit into the grand scheme of things. Another great example I love is all of these black belt revocations. Like when Cyborg revoked Marcel's black belt, I believe, like, Big fucking deal. How can anyone even think of that as a punishment? I find it bizarre that like you'd think like, okay, well, this guy did this terrible thing, but don't worry, everyone. It's all right. We took away the thing that holds his pants up. It's all good (laughs) now. Like we fixed it. Uh, it, It's a good example of of the jujitsu bubble because within the world of jujitsu, having a black belt is like the most reverent thing ever. You don't even have to. I can tell you this because I am this person. You don't even have to be a good black belt. You can just be Mm -hmm. a black belt and people will respect you regardless. But it is it is funny that someone would think that that is like the right punishment in the case of child molestation, right? Like it's, mm-hmm. it, it's funny that he would, someone would even value the black belt enough that they think it belongs in that conversation. No, the correct thing to do is you put this fucker in jail. Whether or not he maintains a black belt is irrelevant. It's a stupid piece of fabric and we care way too much about it, especially because it's not regulated in the sport, right? There's anyone, there's no standard for getting a black belt. It's not a professional designation. Just because someone has a black belt doesn't mean they're necessarily great at jujitsu or that they've done all of the things that we should expect of a black belt. It's just a personal decision that some instructor made about one of their students based on how well that guy can whoop ass in his pajamas. That's all a black belt is. It says nothing of your character, of your teaching ability, of your business acumen, of your ethics, of whether you even and follow the rules that did kind of catch me when I saw Cyborg's statement and he finally sort of started trying to do something about this but one of the big things he cl- he said was we took away his black belt like are you gonna go to the cops and say don't worry guys it's all under control <laughs> yeah. these guys are brown bound now I fixed it it just it, it's, it's almost insulting to me that someone would think that's an adequate remedy exactly like I, I think I mean I know it was some effort to distance himself from Marcel after everything, you know, it it was just a very, like, like it, it would be weird not to do that. You know, (laughs) like it would be weird for the instructor not to do that. You kind of have to disown him. Yeah, exactly. Of course. But like at the same time, that black belt is the result of years and years and years of training, which I know you cannot control everything your student does. You know, there, there's always going to be a few bad eggs and like, if someone comes out of nowhere and does something terrible, like that's not necessarily on you as an instructor, you know, if you did not see that coming. But like, at the same time, like, what's going to happen now? Is he going to walk into a gym and be like, hey, got my black belt revoked. I'm a white belt now. But I have all these years of jujitsu experience, like they're just as harmful. They're just just as dangerous as they were before. And that's what makes it all the more important to make sure that when somebody does do something terrible in the sport, that every single measure is taken so that they can't harm somebody with all the knowledge they have of violence. Mm-hmm. You know, like mm-hmm. it, it's not enough to take the symbolic belt from them. It, you have to do everything in your power to make sure that that person cannot go and get even better at violence or be put in a position where they can harm people who can't defend themselves against them or harm people at all, even if they can defend themselves against them. You know, like there's so much more responsibility that has to be taken when you are a teacher of violence. Yeah. Like I mentioned earlier, I think people have, at least I know for myself, I had Mm -hmm. a warped understanding of how likely it is that justice for these kinds of crimes will be served. I always assumed based on my, my Hollywood education that if you assaulted someone or 
stole something or if you abused someone, that justice would be served with like a 100% success rate. But in the real world, if you've ever had a friend go through something like this, you understand how hard it actually is to get someone locked up in jail, especially for something like a sexual misconduct. It's so hard to get the evidence out, especially in a, a field like jujitsu, where there's such a pressure not to provide that evidence and there's such hostility towards um, breaking these stories. I think that people don't understand how hard it is to actually get justice. Uh, I remember the first time I saw this, I used to train at a gym. I, I left it and I found out a few years later that it had kind of been rocked in a big scandal because there were uh, rape accusations against the head instructor. And I, I was shocked at how that, you know, these things just don't go anywhere a lot of the time. The accusations are made, but a lot of the time the people just get off without any jail time whatsoever. There's no consequences. And for me, that was a big realization about how hard it is to get justice on some of these things. I've noticed when you go on Reddit or the internet and these stories are broken, the first thing that happens is a bunch of dudes are going to crawl out of the woodwork and say, well, how do you know that this isn't a false accusation? My buddy had a false accusation against him and it ruined his life. How can you trust this? Look, like the odds of it being a false accusation versus the odds of it actually happened and this woman is risking basically her personal reputation to try to seek justice like it, it's not even close it's way more likely that there's fire behind that smoke than that it's some crazy ex-girlfriend or whatever and it mm -hmm. always pisses me off when people say well how do you know it's just not a crazy ex-girlfriend because like, mm -hmm. you you would have to be real crazy to ruin your whole life to try to seek justice against someone who wronged you right and statistically speaking it's way more likely that what actually happened was it was true versus that it's some false accusation. It's way, way more likely. Mm -hmm. And the people who who give these anecdotes, because I hear this a lot where people will say, oh, false accusations do happen because I have a buddy of mine and he was falsely accused and it ruined his life. If that's the first thing that comes to your mind, the question I always have for that person right after is, how do you know that your buddy was falsely accused? Do you, yeah. Are you just believing him because you're, he's your buddy? Because that's the exact sort of thing that leads to the Cyborg Wagner situation is nobody wants to turn on their friends. No one wants to hold their closest friends accountable. And some, But sometimes you have to. That's part of leadership. That's part of being a, a good team manager is you have to understand that loyalty is not unconditional. It's great to have f strong, loyal relationships with the people on your team, but loyalty is not an absolute. I mean, if one of your team members does something absolutely heinous that is not aligned with your core values, you should have the strength of character to stand up against that person and distance yourself and hold them accountable. And I, I think part of the problem is you got these people in jujitsu who never expected they'd, they'd be in this kind of leadership situation and they're not trained for this and then it happens and they do the wrong thing, it seems, more often than right. No, exactly. And you hit the nail on the head there when you said like, there's no training for this. There's often no policies in gyms. You know, like what happens if somebody makes an accusation or if you are aware that, you know, somebody is coming into your gym and they have, you know, a conviction on their record or at least, you know, a credible accusation that is, you know, backed up with some kind of evidence. Like, what do you do in that situation? And the reality is that most people, most coaches in jujitsu, they don't have that training. They were just good at jujitsu, said, hey, I think I can get some students with how good I am at jujitsu. And they open their own gym or they get hired at a gym to teach. And when something like this happens, like there's no policy for what to do. And then what you have is, you know, and, and I understand, like, I, I can only imagine what it would be like to have a friend who is accused of something terrible and have to make that choice. Like I have friends who have said some like former friends who have said some, you know, really dumb, like racist, homophobic, transphobic shit. And I've said, you know what, like, I don't want to be your friend anymore. And I've had to have that conversation with them. So I'm no stranger to like cutting people off. I've certainly cut people off for less terrible things than assault, you know. And so like, I'm sure it would be very difficult to have somebody close to me who is accused of something terrible and have to make that choice. But there's so many people in jujitsu who just straight up don't care. And they will make every excuse under the sun for these people. And oh, like, it, you know, it, this instructor, this married 40 year old instructor has been 
grooming their teenage student for all these years, but she was coming on to him. You know, like she was flirting with him. She was sending him pictures as though the 40 year old instructor doesn't have better cognitive reasoning than the teenager. You know what I mean? Like stuff like that just kind of blows my mind. You know, like as a, you know, I'm 29, you know, I cannot imagine even seeing, you know, somebody who's like five years younger than me as being a potential partner. And I know that's not the same for everybody. I'm not judging any 29 year old who wants to date a 24 year old, but like the, the gigantic age differences there and the terrible judgments that are being made and the people who defend these people who are making the choices, like I don't understand it. And to me, there's this hierarchy, especially in jujitsu. I'm sure it exists elsewhere as well. I know it exists elsewhere. But there's this hierarchy of complicity that happens where it's, you know, sure, there are only a quote unquote, a few people at the top making these choices. But then there's all these people below them that build this pyramid to help them stay at the top. You know, there's the people right below them who say like, oh, it's okay, man, like you can still come train at my gym. I'll still pay you to teach you know, and they're financially supporting them or vocally supporting them. And then there's the people below those people who are maybe the students that say, yeah, like this person at the top did this terrible thing, but like, that's not my coach directly. Or like, they they justify the distance from that person at the top, you know, to say, oh, I can still support their organization or, you know, I don't have to really speak out against them. And then there's the the huge number of people at the bottom who are just happy to stay silent on that mm-hmm. and who don't necessarily say anything to support the person at the top, but they're also not putting themselves out there and speaking out or, you know, doing anything to help the situation or to change the culture. And all of that stuff, that pyramid, that foundation supports the few people at the top who are doing these terrible things. And then the people right below them who are still financially or vocally, you know, however way they're supporting those people at the top who are doing these awful things. Like, it's everybody's responsibility to do something about this. It's not just the law's responsibility. Like, you can say, oh, the, you know, we have to leave it in the hands of the, the courts, in the hands of the law. Like, yeah, from a legal standpoint, we have to do that. But we also have to enforce that within our own sport. And that doesn't mean dojo storming the gym and beating the shit out of anybody. It's just a matter of saying, hey, like, you can't compete at my tournaments anymore. You can't compete in my events anymore. Like, hey, I'm leaving your school because I don't support you still being under this flag. I'm not just talking about fight sports. Like, this is a problem in a lot of organizations, even smaller organizations. But yeah, like, there, there's so much more that everyday people have to do. You know, you have to pressure your coaches to put in harassment policies and to stick to those. You have to promote organizations who are promoting, you know, mental health support and domestic violence support. Like there's so much that we all can do. It should not just be in the hands of the law if we want to protect people within the sport. Yeah, I think uh, one of the big issues is there's such an inherent, I mean, you put aside even just the fact that most of our community leaders are not trained to be leaders. They don't know how Mm -hmm. to respond to a crisis like this. But even beyond that, I think there's a massive conflict of interest in terms of expecting instructors to hold their team accountable. Because, Mm -hmm. I mean, look, the reality is if you are a competition-oriented gym, your bread and butter is earned by you being able to put out ace competitors. So if it turns out that one of your top competitors does something awful, you're incentivized to suppress it because you don't want to lose that person. They're your meal ticket. Similarly, if it's one of your top instructors, you don't want to lose them because it's going to impact your ability to teach. And that kind of reverse incentivization, I think, makes it very hard for instructors to take action because if they kick out the, those offenders, they are hurting themselves financially as well. And I think that's part of the reason why there's so little action taken is because it's hard It's hard to kill your own meal ticket. And I think ultimately that's what we're asking instructors to do. And we need to better equip them to do that. And I think we actually need to better celebrate the instructors who do this because there are mm-hmm. instructors out there who do this, who are very, very rigorous about 
about screening their students and their instructors, and they take this stuff dead seriously. We had uh, Jeff Shaw, the head instructor of Bellingham BJJ on the podcast, and he takes this stuff super seriously. I posted some quotes that he'd said about it on Reddit, and some people were, because basically what Jeff said is like, look, you got to vet the people in your gym. You know, you got to do background checks. You got to make sure they're not crazy criminals or they're not doing anything bad, and you need to constantly be proactively monitoring the culture and kicking out the bad apples. And a bunch of people on Reddit said like, that's unrealistic. No, but nobody does that. You simply can't run a business that way. And I find that baffling because I know Jeff does it. I know a lot Mm -hmm. of other instructors do it. I know in the broader world outside of jujitsu, in the vast majority of businesses, they do this kind of screening. So I don't understand why it's so hard to expect that a jujitsu gym would keep itself clean of bad behavior. I don't know why we see that as such an unreasonable ask. No, I completely agree with you. And I think, again, that comes back to a point that you touched on where when we do see people who are making the right choices, we as, you know, the the quote unquote underlings, you know, the students, we need to actively support and promote those gyms. You know, like if you're if you see a gym that is actively showing that they support minorities, you know, if they're saying, hey, racism isn't tolerated here, sexual assault isn't tolerated here bigotry as a whole is not tolerated here and you see the effort that they are going through to change the culture like that's the gym you should be signing up at you know it doesn't matter if the gym a few you know a few minutes down the road has some big name athlete there if you want to make the sport as a whole better you need to go where there are people who are actively trying to make it better not just where people are trying you know, obviously like like you mentioned everybody wants to get paid, everyone wants to put food on the table. But if you want the right people to be putting food on the table and making the sport a better place, you need to go there, you know, support those people, even just if you're far away from them, buy their merch. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like get a shirt from them, like do something so that you're supporting the people who are doing the right thing so that those gyms can flourish. And the ones who are only out for you know, the the big name guys at, you know, their gyms or whatever, so that they are not necessarily flourishing as much or that they are pressured to do the right thing instead of just looking out for themselves. Yeah. And I think sometimes we collectively underestimate how much power we, the the general peons in this community actually have, because you're right. I mean, one individual person might not have that much leverage, but if we as a collective group agree that we're not going to reward bad behavior, we can all make a difference. I still get messages from people telling me with disgust that they still see Lloyd Irvin hanging out at big picture tournaments and stuff and hanging out with people. He's still all over the place. You would have thought that his career would have been done almost a decade ago after the revelations against him, but he's still around. And ultimately he's still around because people are allowing him to still be around. Someone Mm -hmm. out there is financially rewarding him. There are people who are giving him money and you don't have to do that, right? There's, there's Mm -hmm. a lot of gyms run by hardworking, nice people that just mom and basically mom and pop jujitsu gyms. You can support these people. I know they exist. You don't have to go to the gyms that exhibit the kind of toxic behavior that is not in line with your values. And I know how hard it is to cut that out because I've had to do it. You could be at a gym for years and just be willfully or unwillfully ignorant of what's actually going on around you. And you could just realize one day, whoa, actually there's, there's an underbelly to this gym that I didn't know was there. And it's hard to leave because like you mentioned at the beginning, we invest so much of our social circles in a jujitsu gym. Leaving Mm -hmm. a jujitsu gym is not like, I mean, I always draw comparisons on here between jujitsu schools and like coffee shops but at the end of the day leaving a jujitsu gym is has a lot more emotional baggage than switching from starbucks to second cup because you have invested relationships with your friends there and to some extent you know if you leave your gym yeah you'll make new friends at the new gym but there's a lot of people that you simply you might be distant from and maybe those people didn't do the bad thing that you're concerned about but you're still going to that relationship could still suffer and that doesn't even get into the whole creanche bullshit where you're held accountable and ostracized and they brigade you and campaign against you that can happen in this crazy sport right so Mm -hmm. it it is very hard to do the right thing i've been there i had to walk away from a gym that i loved but i had to at one point realize this gym is not what i thought it was in terms of the values that i represent it's gone down a bad path and i had to find something else and it was a very hard decision i actually couldn't believe how hard it was for me to switch jujitsu gyms because you would think in the grand scheme of things in life that would be like a minor decision like switching gyms but Mm -hmm. it's 
man, it's harder than breaking up with someone. It's harder than quitting your job. It's real hard to leave your gym because it very quickly becomes the third place in your life. It's like a a social pillar of where you go to network, where you go to unwind, and losing that is hard. And I think we have to acknowledge that, that it it's hard for people to leave these places, but you have to. It's the right thing to do, and you're always going to feel better doing it afterwards, even if it's hard in the moment. You'll always feel better knowing that you walked away from that awful situation. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think what I encourage people to do in those situations, I actually had this conversation with Liz Beaver, but uh, who also is very outspoken on just cult-like mentalities and fitness and jujitsu and martial arts and things like that. But there's a whole psychological aspect that I don't think we think about a lot in jujitsu because I, I know it sounds so cliche and corny, but when we do jujitsu, we are very literally Again, I know this sounds corny, but we are putting our lives and our safety in somebody else's hands. You know, we there's so much consent and trust that goes into this sport where if somebody has us in a choke, we have to trust that if we tap out, they will let go. If they choose not to ever let go, we die, (laughs) you know, Mm -hmm. and that is a very intimate trusting relationship that we enter into. And I'm not, you know, I'm not educated in psychology or anything like that. But you can only assume what that does to somebody's brain. You know, when you're physically that close to somebody, when you're engaging in an act of, you know, pretend violence, essentially, and when you put your safety in that person's hands, surely that does something to your brain that makes it even harder to leave that person that you've engaged in this you know, unspoken and spoken, I guess, contract with them, that you're putting your safety in their hands and vice versa. And so when something bad happens at your gym, or if you know, your coach has something bad, or you decide it's time to leave gyms, it makes it that much harder to leave. It's not just like leaving a job where you're friends with your coworkers, you're leaving a space where you have built up this very primal trust with all these people and you've made it your life and they're supporting you and you're supporting them. And it's this very intimate relationship you have with these people and having to break yourself away from that. That's hard, you know, and getting, you know, whether you're voluntarily leaving or you're getting kicked out, that's very emotionally challenging and even damaging. And I feel like that doesn't get addressed a lot. And it makes it that much easier for those cult like mentalities to be enforced, you know, for the creanche thing to be so prevalent in the sport. Yeah. I think with martial arts too, there's another factor, which is that joining a martial art is somewhat aspirational. It's you don't just go there because you want a thing. You go there because you want to be a certain type of person. You want to be mm-hmm. a confident badass who can take care of themselves, right? Part of what you're getting mm-hmm. when you go to a martial arts gym, it's not just the techniques. It's not just the fitness. It is you're grafting something onto your sense of self, who you are. Mm-hmm. It's very hard to give that up, right? If I buy a PlayStation, I'm buying a PlayStation because I want to play Deathloop. If I yeah. if I go to a jujitsu <laughs> gym, I'm going to a jujitsu gym because for some reason, there's a part of my life that I probably feel is lacking, right? I mean, in my case, I was a 20-something you know, computer nerd. I'd never done anything remotely athletic in my life. And I wanted to be confident and stronger and respected more ultimately. And that's what jujitsu gave to me. And it does give you that, right? It's amazing in its ability to actually do that. But it also makes it hard to have a level head when you're evaluating jujitsu because so much of your sense of self is wrapped up in the sport. So when you leave your gym, you're kind of leaving a piece of yourself behind, which is an incredibly hard thing to ask people to do. Yeah, I completely agree. Something that I've really had to come to terms with recently, both as I've kind of taken a step back from the jujitsu times, and I've also been like, injured for three months, like three separate injuries. So like, (laughs) I haven't been able to go back to jujitsu for three months. And I have like, especially in the beginning, I had this big emotional struggle within myself, like, who am I outside of jujitsu? Like I was that blue belt. And it is still my Instagram and Twitter handle, um, who, you know, I'm BJJ Avery online. And it's like, oh, man, I have to do jujitsu because that's my whole identity. You know, I'm a brown belt at the gym. I'm kind of like in a leader type position at my gym. Like people know who I am because of jujitsu. You know, my work is jujitsu, was jujitsu. You know, I met my partner through jujitsu. He's a brown belt as well. Like, 
it has just been my whole life for the past decade. And as I've taken a step back from that, you know, both from having to because injuries and, you know, as a career choice, I really had to wrestle with myself, like, who am I outside of that? You know, who is Avery? And I know that sounds so ridiculous to people who are not so invested in the sport and who just see it as a hobby. But it's been really healthy, I think, for me to look back on that and to kind of discover that part of myself. And I'm sure for yeah. people who follow me for my jujitsu content, it's been like, what the heck? Why are you posting, you know, about all these bugs, which is another part of my identity. I love bugs. The bugs so are much. the bugs are weird, Avery. I gotta be honest. Like <laughs> I I I'm I wouldn't say I'm scared of bugs, although I gotta say, if you put a spider in front of me, there's like a spider threshold I've got. If it's like a little guy whatever but if it's like if it's so big that i can see the the fur on its legs i'm getting the fuck out of there i want nothing to do with that like i i will proudly say like look i am a jiu-jitsu black belt i will walk in there and let anyone beat my ass but if you put a spider in front of me that is like that big and fuzzy i'm gonna send my wife in to kill it she's much better at that than me i'm not having it uh you got to know your limits right and to me that is the limit bugs can be there's like a happy point where when they're small enough, you can respect that. Hey, they're keeping the garden clean. They're killing the mosquitoes. Great. But at some point, they're a living nightmare and the need to be treated as such. I apologize because oh. I know that's very controversial in your world, but <laughs> that's <laughs> oh, where I stand. I, love big, I would say I like big bugs and I cannot lie. Um, but no, <laughs> I, I really love gigantic spiders and anything big, except big centipedes freak me out. That is the one really? fear I'm really... Oh my God, huh. centipedes are like my phobia. So I'm trying to overcome that and like Weird. love them for who they are, but that is a fight. So yeah. I totally understand. You know, I don't understand arachnophobia, but like I have that fear of centipedes. So I understand the struggle of trying to overcome that. <laughs> so I do have my own struggle with that as well. But um, yeah, it's basically I've been kind of embracing that side of myself a little more getting into the actual fitness side of things, learning how to navigate around like a traditional machines and weights type of gym. And it's still a bit of, I don't want to say it's been a struggle, but it has, but I think it's been healthy. And I think that's important for other people who are very immersed in the jujitsu world to realize as well, is that you are more than the sport. Like if you get injured or if you lose your gym, or if you have to create this little training pod, which I know a lot of people have where they realize, you know, oh, their instructor is a bit racist and there's nowhere else to train in the area. So they have this little training pod where they go in their garage. That's okay. You know, it's okay to just be a hobbyist. You don't have to be an aspiring world champion when you are not getting paid to train jujitsu, you know, especially I know there's a lot of blue belts out there who want to be ADCC champions, and that's great. And maybe yeah, there's a lot of blue belts out there who also have BJJ in their Instagram handle, yeah. and they're like, I'm a future, future 12 time world champion, just not there yet. I'm climbing the mountain. Yeah. yeah, exactly. I think that is probably part of the reason why there's, I was talking to Stefan Kesting about this. Like, there's so much conspiratorial yeah. thinking and stuff in our sport. And I think. A lot of that is wrapped up in the fact that so many people, jujitsu is it's their entire identity. And so when a pandemic happens and you ask people not to train, I think for a lot of these people, ultimately they have to ask themselves, if I can't have jujitsu, what do I have left? And I mm -hmm. wonder if the the crazy, irrational, conspiratorial thinking we see in our community stems from the fact that if jujitsu is all you have and you can't have jujitsu anymore then you are going to probably try to rationalize and defend your your sense of self somehow. And one of the ways that you can do that isn't by embracing conspiracies that tell you, ah, this isn't such a big deal, right? I think that's a yeah. big a big part of it is because a lot of people, I would say, have an unhealthy relationship with jujitsu. And I definitely have, I was at that phase in my life too, where jujitsu basically took over everything and it was all I did and all I cared about. But I think at some point, just as part of getting older, you've got to disentangle your identity from jujitsu and have an authentic sense of self that doesn't require you to sweat on people while you're wearing pajamas. That's... <laughs> I mean, I got nothing against the pajama wrestling, but at the end of the day, even for a person who is fully and truly dedicated to the sport, you've got to have something more in your life. It's just not healthy to have one thing that defines you. Exactly. And I think that applies to everything. But, you know, like we've discussed over the course of this podcast, like jujitsu just like encases people so much. And it is so I, I keep using the word cult like. 
But it really it is. is. <laughs> you know, it really is. And I think, you know, even in the early stages of jujitsu, even as you feel yourself getting so involved in it and you have these big dreams in jujitsu and you want to make it your career, you want to make it your life, even if you have a really good chance of doing that, it's still really healthy to just identify one other thing in your life where if you get injured or if you have to move or if you end up jobless and can't train for a while, you know, if if another pandemic happens, what can you do? What else is going to bring you fulfillment that the jujitsu world brings you right now. I, I just think that's healthy no matter what hobby you're engaged. And I think it's all the more important when your hobby is as potentially dangerous as jujitsu is, you know, with <laughs> not only, you know, joints breaking and whatnot, but also just the risk of illness, you know, in a case like COVID, you know, you we joke all the time about like, oh, this person just sweated into my eyeball or my mouth. Like <laughs> it's close contact, you know, like, oh, but it's safe yes. to train in a pandemic, like, you know, a bit of, bit of weirdness there. But yeah, I would just advise everybody, no matter what stage of jujitsu you're in, to just find something else, whatever it is, find something else that you love and, you know, make sure that that's there just in case jujitsu can't be. Well, let let me ask you a question then. You've got a Mm -hmm. magic wand. You can change one thing about jujitsu and its community. What do you use that magic wand to change? Oh, that is a good question. (laughs) Um, I, I honestly think it would be better regulation and more resources. You know, where even if the people who are enraptured by the cult mentality don't stand up against their bad coaches, that there's some higher organization who has that power who can enforce some rules. And then on the other side of that, there's somebody helping people who have not only been victimized through jujitsu, but, you know, there's so many people who started jujitsu because they had some underlying trauma. You know, I know a lot of women, a lot of minorities have experienced something that brought them to jujitsu that they want to protect themselves. And I think there should be mental health resources in place to help people who not only have physical emergencies on the mats, you know, if your knee gets broken or your elbow gets broken, but also mental health emergencies. If you freeze up because you're underneath somebody, how does the instructor handle that? There's an emerging organization called Off the Zone. You can follow them on Instagram, but they're doing workshops and things like that for that specific purpose to help with mental health emergencies that happen on the mats to educate instructors on how to deal with that. If somebody has PTSD and it comes up on the mats, how do you handle that? And I think that's really important in a sport that is so close contact and where so many people are coming to jiu-jitsu because of trauma that they've experienced or because of fear that they've experienced. I just think that would create a much healthier environment. Like we need to deal with the problems at the top, but also the people who are affected by those problems. Yeah, it uh, reminds me of the article you actually wrote, The Call is Coming from Inside the Gym. I, To mm-hmm. me, that's my favorite Avery article. It's uh, oh, I, I think you. it's I think it's a watershed moment in the sport. At least it was for me personally, because it really opened up my eyes and made me realize that to some extent, we're failing to fulfill the promise of jujitsu, which is it makes you more powerful. It allows you to protect yourself. But if you're being completely honest, as you said in your article, if we're all being totally honest with ourselves, there's a lot of people who got into jujitsu to protect themselves. And because they got into jujitsu, they probably wound up getting exposed to and exploited by predators that they actually wouldn't have met if not for the fact that they got into jujitsu. So Mm -hmm. to some extent, we're we're kind of failing our next generation because the reason they get into this sport is at odds with what actually happens to them when they're in the sport. And if we want jujitsu to be what we say it is, which is, is this incredible system for personal growth, for building confidence, for learning to protect yourself, then our community and its integrity, they have to represent that too. We can't have people getting exploited and abused when they come into jujitsu, learning how to protect themselves from exactly that. It doesn't make sense. It's not the right thing. And we've got to hold those people accountable. Yeah, I I completely agree. And yeah, I've I've just heard so many stories about that, you know, where, and and jujitsu, if you look at the marketing around jujitsu, especially, you know, for women, it's always, you know, come do this self-defense seminar, defend yourself from the rapist in the bushes. When statistically speaking, the person who's more likely to harm you, whether that's domestic violence or, 
you know, whatever other type of violence. It's the people who are closest to you. It's our acquaintances, our friends, our our romantic partners. And when you go into a jiu-jitsu gym, guess what you get more of? <laughs> more friends, mm-hmm. more acquaintances. So yeah, like you, you have to make sure that the people coming into your gym are, you know, to the best of your ability. We can't prevent every single bad thing from happening. But you got to make sure that your gym is a safe place for potential victims and an un, I don't want to say like an unsafe place, like you're going to get beat up if you do something bad, but like it, that, it, that it's unwelcoming to people who would do harm to your students. Yes, definitely. Well, thank you, Avery. That was fantastic. I know that you're not at the Times anymore, but if people want to follow you, how do they do that? Yeah, um, I'm on Instagram as BJJ Avery. <laughs> Again, my blue belt handle. Um, and <laughs> also on Twitter. I don't really tweet a whole lot about jujitsu. It's more just like random dumb thoughts that rattle around in my brain at midnight. But yeah, I'm always happy to chat. And yeah, I, I'll still be at the Jiu-Jitsu Times. I'm still going to be writing. You'll see my stuff around just not as frequently and more of the stuff that I am passionate about. So less news coverage and more stuff that I think is important. Fantastic. And if anyone wants to check out our stuff, get in contact with me or do a deep dive into the concepts we talk about here on the show, the best place to do that is bjjmentalmodels.com. Full database of all of the concepts we discuss, plus a contact form to reach out to me. Also links off to everything else that we make and everything else that we do. And if you like this stuff and you want to dig deeper into the concepts, if you want our help building a game plan, reviewing your tech footage, all of that, you can go to premium.bjjmentalmodels.com. It's the single best way to support the show and to also get the most value out of it as well. There's a lot of awesome strategy content on there, as well as some cool audio programs we're working on with a bunch of world champs. It's really awesome stuff. Again, premium.bjjmentalmodels.com. There's a free trial so you can check it out. No risk to yourselves. Let me know what you think. I always love to have people join us. I always get happy when I get a little notification saying that someone else new is on there. So please do consider it if you're not already a member. Avery, thank you so much for coming by. I'm so excited that I got a chance to talk to you. And of course, again, huge thank you from myself and I guess by extension from the community here for all of the stuff you've done for BJJ. Sad to see you go from the times, but I think you really left an imprint here and I I think you've definitely changed us all for the better. So thank you for everything that you've done. Oh, and right back at you, Steve. Um, This is a a really amazing and needed podcast that you're doing. Um, I I really appreciate what you've done for the community as well. And this has been a huge honor for me to be a part of it. Awesome. And of course, to everyone out there who hangs out with us every week and listens to us, thank you so much for your time. And we'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you.